So this morning we're going to be working from a passage in Luke, in, uh, in early Luke, and so we're going to go ahead and start off by reading that passage together this morning. So we'll be reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Now every year his parents, this is talking about Jesus when he was young, now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was nearly 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of this. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So 30 years ago, uh, a study like no other uh, was started. In August of 2001, can you even get back? I mean, this is pre-September 11th, okay? That, that's going to give you the time frame. 30 years ago, August of 2001, a study was started by a uh, child sociologist, a uh, sociologist of religion, a guy named Christian Smith. Uh, Christian Smith, Dr. Smith, started a study that would be known as the National Study of Youth and Religion. This is the most comprehensive longitudinal study that has ever been done in uh, looking at the faith formation of youth, uh, but not only while they are teenagers, moving into adulthood. Uh, by far the largest study that had ever been done and that still has ever been done. Uh, actually, the first book I wrote, a book called Hollow Faith, was based on this study. Uh, I wrote it in... 2011, uh, because the, uh, the findings of this study were coming out around, the, the initial findings, the 10-year findings, were coming out around 2010, 2011. The book that came out, uh, the first book that came out of this study was a book called Soul Searching that, that Dr. Christian Smith wrote, and this book was groundbreaking. Uh, it had a number of findings about youth uh, faith formation, uh, and especially the uh, faith formation that was happening in the home. Here are the two major findings that came out of the initial 10 years of the study. Number one, parents have 72% influence over their students, over their youths, their children, 72% spiritual influence over them. Not youth group, not sitting in a church, not their friends, not a Bible study they go to with a no, none of that. 72% comes directly from the parents. The other thing this study found was that parents were practicing a form of Christianity called moralistic therapeutic deism. Basically, here's what that means. Moralistic means that uh, we just want you to be good people. Therapeutic uh, God is here to make you feel good. Deism, but he's not too close. God's really far away in a distant universe and not directly involved in our everydayness. Moralistic therapeutic deism. These were the two major findings that came out of the initial 10 years of that study. That study has continued over the past 30 years, and the most re recent findings, the 30-year findings, have come out. Now, what you have to remember is he has been studying these same back in 2001, teenagers, all the way through their life. So these folks are now in their 30s and 40s, and he is still studying the longitudinal effects of their faith formation as teenagers. The most recent uh, book that has come out that, that uh, Christian Smith has written is a book called Handing Down the Faith. And whereas 20 years ago, the, it pointed to two major findings, they kept digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And they have pinpointed one primary thing, overwhelmingly, one thing influences the long-term faith formation of teenagers more than anything else. Nothing else, if you, if you ever listen to a presentation from him, he will reemphasize this over and over again. Nothing else even comes close. Nothing else holds a candle to this one thing. The number one 
determiner of faith after high school that students experience as teenagers is this. Whether or not their parents talked about faith, religion, and the Bible in meaningful and everyday ways as a part of their teenage years. And it's not just talking about it, it's conversing about it. Did parents talk about their faith in ways that affected their everyday decisions as individuals, their everyday decisions as families? Did they talk about it in terms of how they understand their political views, their worldviews, their ethical views? Did, was faith a predominant factor or the dominant factor in how they talked about the decisions they made and the lives they lived, and did they have those conversations with their teenagers? The number one overwhelming determiner as to whether a child in this massive study continued to have strong faith practices as an adult. Now, here's the problem. Number one, that's a heavy weight for parents, right? Like if you're a parent of a teenager or younger, you probably felt gravity get a little stronger in that moment, right? Here's the next problem. Another study was done uh, about two years ago by a, a guy named Dr. Andrew Zersky. Zersky says this. He did a massive study of parents and uh, trying to parse out if this is what makes long-term faith happen in teenagers, then what's preventing us from doing that? And the study overwhelmingly said that parents are terrified and feel ill-equipped and under-equipped to talk about faith, religion, and the Bible, especially with their kids. Scared to death that the kids are gonna ask a question that they can't answer. Scared to death that their own views that they think they might have, maybe, but not really sure, will get questioned or called into question or even disproven a fear of not knowing the Bible. And so for this reason, we believe, in, in, in the study of youth and religion, we believe that the number one inhibitor is parents' inability, or their seeming, their, their feeling that they have the inability to talk about faith in meaningful ways with their children. Now, another piece that has really played into this is that there is an overwhelming cultural illusion, and this is proven out through studies, that parents believe that once a child becomes a teenager, they have no influence over them. That their influences are friends, social media, uh, external sources, and for Christian families, the church or youth group. So there's a cultural illusion that we have found cannot be farther from the truth that you as parents, if, you, if you're a parent, that you don't have the overwhelming influence. And again and again, the studies say, yes, you do. And here's the thing. Originally, we believed that 72% influence over a child's spirituality, originally we believed that that was between 13 and 18. Okay, that was between the ages of 13 and 18. Here's what this longitudinal, this 30-year study has proven. Your influence as a parent over your child's spirituality doesn't just last their teenage years, doesn't just last their young adult years. We are seeing the same level of influence last for decades. And they believe that because they're getting to a certain point, it will be a lifetime influence. Again, gravity just got a little heavier. So what do we do? Oh, I wanna give you one more piece. 82% of 25 to 29 year olds who said faith is a deep part, a deep influencer of who they are and what they do, 82% of that demographic whose faith matters most of them had parents who talked about their own faith and theology regularly at home as one of their primary influences. So the problem's there, the evidence is there, now what do we do? about it. So I want to point us back to this passage in Luke with Jesus as a little boy, and I want, I want to tease out a couple of things that we see, not only in this passage, but things that we can tease out, I think, with some level of integrity 
because we understand the religion and the culture in which Jesus grew up in. Remember, Jesus was a first century Jew. Jesus did not grow up in a Christian household. He went to temple, he went to synagogue. He, he, he was a Jew and Jewish practice is what dominated his life. And so when we look at this passage, we can understand a few things about it from, we can understand a few things about the way Jesus was raised and the spiritual influence in his life based on this passage. The first thing that we can read into this is that in Judaism, both in ancient Judaism as well as modern Judaism, faith is a built-in part of the family structure. If you're a practicing Jew, you are keeping the calendar. You are practicing, you are doing the feasts and the festivals. Passover is a huge time. It's not just something like, you know, we do Easter, right? We do, we do Lent and then we do Easter. That's the closest thing that we get to that as Christians. Obviously we have Advent too, but that's Christmas, right? We get presents at the end of that one, that's nice. But if we look back at this passage, the passage starts off as they were on a journey to Jerusalem for Passover. This was a regular part of their year. This was a regular part of their cycle. They were practicing and doing faith together as a family. And here's the key takeaway. Faith was not an adult's only venture. One of the beautiful things about the Passover, about the Seder meal, about the Passover feast is this. You know who starts the Seder meal? Anybody know? It's the youngest one at the table. They ask a question, and that's what starts the liturgy of the Seder meal. In Judaism, the, the faith that Jesus grew up in, young people were not only invited in, but they were valued. So I think the first thing that we can take away from this, if we want to think about uh, making uh, generational change in terms of our Christian communities, faith formation of our students, we have to do faith together as a family. The second thing that I think we can infer into this, that we can read into this story, is by asking the question, why the heck did it take four days for them to figure out that Jesus wasn't with them? It's either they were horrible parents, I'm going to reserve judgment, I'm going to wait on that one, or there was deep trust in their community. Churches are not always the easiest place to trust. A lot of people, even in this congregation, have come from places, and the reason why you're here is because you've been hurt somewhere else. Church trauma is a very real thing that is a real experience for thousands and thousands of Christians in the United States, and I guarantee you, I know from conversations with you, a large number of folks in this church are here because they experienced church trauma and they had to find somewhere else. There was trust in their faith community. There was grace and vulnerability practiced in their faith community and so much trust that they could literally lose their kid for four days. One of the things I love about this place that we call Grace is that this is a place that I've experienced beautiful vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability in small groups and private conversations in the way we do worship and the way that we have committed to come together as a community. Now the third thing I wanna, I wanna kinda point out is actually a, a study that has nothing to do with religion. Uh, about 25 years ago, uh, and you can look this video up by the way, we, couldn't get it into the slides today. But about 25 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a study done with fleas, okay? And uh, if you've ever seen a flea, it, it hops, right? Fleas just pop up and they hop, and that's how they kind of get away. And they can, hop, they can jump really high. Fleas are, can jump incredibly high, okay? So they did this study where they had a glass jar, and you can look up this video, just look, at, uh, look up fleas glass ceiling. Look that up on YouTube, you'll find this study. And there was a glass jar, and they took, uh, I think it was like 500 fleas and a little thing, dumped them into the glass jar, and then put a top on the glass jar. The glass jar is about this big. And you can see the fleas just bouncing everywhere. It's just rapid fire, bouncing, 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 bouncing. The study then says that they left the fleas in there for three months with the lid on. So over the course of three months, these fleas that could literally jump this high off the ground 
were limited to this much space to jump. They're hitting their heads against the, the ceiling. And eventually they stopped hitting their heads against the ceiling and they landed just a little bit below it. Three months later, they take the lid off the jar. Not a single flea jumped out because they had been conditioned to have a ceiling. You take the ceiling off, they stayed conditioned. Now here's what's amazing. Not only did those fleas continue to have that same limited jump radius or limited jump height for the rest of their lives, they continued to have that same limitation. When they had babies, when little flea babies were born, that same jump height was passed down genetically through them, through a mimetic, what's called mimetic memory. Their kids never, their little flea babies never jumped higher than their adults. We're not fleas, but here's what's happened. Uh, part of this study has said that we do the exact same thing with faith development. Smith writes about the dynamic as akin to parents setting a glass ceiling of religious commitment above which their children rarely rise. It is a, it is a two-sided sword. We have massive influence as parents in the faith formation of our kids. We have incredible influence, but we also have the ability to limit them and box them in and to never give them the opportunity to grow and rise above where we ourselves are in our own faith formation. So again, let's look back at the passage. We have Jesus, you know, when they finally find him, where is he? In the temple. And he's in the temple talking with the religious leaders. Now, that's not that he just went to church and the janitor was hanging out and he was like, he was like hey, you want to talk about faith? He's talking with the primary spiritual influencers for the entire religion. He's in the temple. And he's talking with them. And here's what the passage says. It says, after three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. So he's listening and asking. First thing is, he's allowed in there. Okay, let's hear that. He's allowed, he's in the conversation. Don't, by any stretch of the imagination, believe that this is a Jesus, that this is a um, special dispensation for Jesus. Jesus was a, a little kid who wandered into the temple. Okay, he wasn't special to these people. So the first thing he's there, the second thing is he is listening and asking questions. And then it says, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So we have this scenario where Jesus is invited in, not because he's special, but because that's, what's, that's the expectation is that children would be a part of the discussion. So he's allowed to come in but he doesn't sit as a participant in the pew and have to just sit there quietly and listen. He is invited into the conversation as a 12-year-old. And it says not only did he understand and ask questions, so again, he's not just sitting there, he is participating. It said that they were amazed by his understanding and his answers. Now, it's easy to gloss right over that, but I want you to pay attention to that. They were amazed by his answers. Guess what? If he's giving answers, guess what they're doing? What are they doing? They're asking questions. This is not, oh, let's let him in and we'll talk and let him listen, and then, you know, he'll, he can regurgitate what we've told him. They are in real dialogue. Go back to Christian Smith's survey his study, this 30-year longitudinal study, what does it say? It says, are we in real dialogue about faith with our kids, period. If we are, the rate skyrockets that our kids' faith will continue for the rest of their life. If we are not, it drops through the floor. Now, I want to point to Jesus as, a, as an adult, as we kind of close up here. 
This was not something that we saw just happen with Jesus as a child, being in these kinds of conversations. We see Jesus as an adult, as a teacher, as a rabbi, embracing this same kind of pedagogy. Jesus as an adult taught in parables, right? These are stories that have a deeper meaning. He taught in these parables, and we only see one to two times in Scripture, in all four Gospels, where Jesus takes the parable, which, by the way, is a metaphorical teaching. We only see once or twice where he actually interprets or gives the answer to the parable. Jesus' pedagogy was conversational. It was open-ended. Jesus wanted people to own the faith for themselves, to interpret it for themselves. He didn't sit there and give you the list of rules of things you have to do. He had conversations. He asked open-ended questions. He listened for answers. It was dialogical. I think the problem so often is that as parents, we feel like we have to know the answer before we get into the conversation. It's like, you know, a lot of times uh, folks will say, uh, a good lawyer will never ask a question that they don't already have an answer to. We've adopted that same model, I think, a lot of times as parents, because we're so scared. What are they gonna ask? What are they gonna, what are they gonna dig into that we have no clue about? What, 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 what are they gonna push back against of my faith that I'm not even really settled on myself? You see, as, as, as parents, we've leaned into, so often, the feeling that we have to be certain. A number of years ago, a man named Peter Enns, who we used his book last year as the summer study, Peter Enns uh, wrote a book called The Sin of Certainty. We've leaned into that in modern parenting because if we don't have a very firm grasp that we can, a, a, real, a real strong grasp, real firm face that we can put out there and, 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 and show that this is what you do, this is how you believe, blah, blah, blah. we're scared to death that they're gonna go in the opposite direction. Here's what's interesting. All the studies say right the opposite. All the studies say that instead of certainty, instead of certainty that we should be leaning into some spectrum of conviction and curiosity. Move from certainty into conviction, which means I believe something. We're not, no one's asked you not to believe something or even say what you believe. It's just saying you have a conviction about that. You're not certain, but you have a conviction. And if we can function on this, par- uh, this, this scale between conviction and curiosity where we say, you know what? I don't have a clue the answer to that question. I have been struggling with that for 25 years. In fact, theologians have been working through it with billions of pages of literature over the past 2,000 years. Away from certainty and into the spectrum of conviction and curiosity. And that's what we see in the life of Jesus. Now, uh, here, here's the thing. <clears throat> As adults, uh, our beliefs, our ideas get locked in. Okay? They get locked in. Uh, that, that's an evolutionary thing that's happening with us. Um, you don't have to touch a hot pan 50 times to remember not to touch the hot pan, right? Our beliefs get locked in in a similar manner. And so, fluctuating on the spectrum of Conviction to curiosity, that causes adults some neurological pain. (laughs) You're having to open up your paradigm, the one that allows you to function each and every day of your life. You're having to open it up and make it vulnerable again. Jean Piaget, uh, 20th century uh, Swedish psychologist, gave us two terms that really help us out with this. The, The terms that Piaget give us are assimilation, and accommodation. And he talks about this in terms of the learning development of children. He says, when children have begun to develop a worldview and they, are, and they encounter new information, one of two things happens. 
They either assimilate that new information, that paradigm-shifting, paradigm-challenging information, they either assimilate it into their current paradigm and say, oh, that's a one-off, or oh, that's, that's not reality, or oh, that's a special circumstance. My paradigm still works. Or they accommodate that new information that challenges their paradigm. They go, okay, I've got to open my paradigm back up because new information has entered, it's challenging that paradigm, and I've got to retool it and rethink it. That's happening in children as young as the age of five. It is happening on a such, on on an amazingly more concentrated scale the older you get. It is harder and harder, it's more and more difficult to open up that paradigm. But again, if we're willing to engage with our students, with our kids, if we're willing to open up the paradigm and not be certain, but function, function between conviction and curiosity, it can make all the difference. Now, how many of you do not have a teenager in the room right now? Raise your hand, please. Okay, great, so like 80% of the room, you're like, why did I come to church this morning? Here's why. Because faithful parenting looks like faithful living. Look at these things. These are also rules for how we can live a faithful life, not just how we can parent faithfully. Our faith is not segmented, but is the basis for our decisions, priorities, and our lives. It's not just something we should be doing with our kids, it's something we should be doing inside of ourselves. Faith formation is a regular part of our ritual and that it orders our days, weeks, and months. That's not just something we should be doing as a family, it's something that we should be doing as individuals, as maturing Christian adults. Trust in the community of faith, practice vulnerability and grace with each other. And then last but not least, having the humility to function on the spectrum of conviction and curiosity instead of certainty and continuing to allow the Spirit of God to shape us, mold us, break us, and remold us again and again, day after day, week after week, year after year. If we can do this, we not only have the opportunity to increase and deepen our own faith, but this faith community community can deeply impact the faith of generations to come. May it be so here at Grace. Amen.